Hi guys, welcome to Biochemistry and Cell Biology, and in this presentation I'll be covering oxidative phosphorylation. So the learning objectives for this are to outline the process of oxidative phosphorylation, to be able to calculate the net yield of ATP from the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation, to be able to work out the net yield of ATP from the entire process of glucose metabolism, and to know about the few exceptions from the electron transport chain. So let's just have a quick recap of the two previous PowerPoints that we've covered. The first one was about glycolysis, which occurs in the cytosol. Then we moved on to the citric acid cycle, which occurs in the matrix. And then finally moving on to oxidative phosphorylation, which occurs at the, at the mitochondrial inner membrane. So let's just have a quick brief overview of the electron transport chain. So electrons are passed down a series of proteins until it reaches the final electron acceptor, which is oxygen which allows it to set up a proton gradient which drives the production of ATP from ATP synthase. So this here is a is a dumbed down, I wouldn't say dumbed down, but a shorter version of what the electron transport chain actually looks like. So as we can see there's all sorts of lines going about, we've got ions going in and out of the place and it probably makes you want to cry like poor little Gara up there in the corner. But actually we're going to break it down bit by bit just so you know that it's not actually as bad as what it looks although there is one bit that will probably mess you up a little bit, but it's biology that's going to happen. So let's turn that frown upside down, let's let Guy Sensei take over, and let's get on with it. So to start off with, there are several proteins involved in the electron transport chain. We have NADH dehydrogenase, which is going to be abbreviated to complex 1, or as I'm going to um, abbreviate it to, is C1. There's also ubiquinone, which is also known as coenzyme Q10, or sometimes Q coenzyme Q. Then we've got cisnet dehydrogenase, which is complex 2 or C2. Cytochrome C oxidoreductase, which is complex 3 or C3. Cytochrome oxidase, which is complex 4 or C4. And then there is ATP synthase, which is sometimes abbreviated to complex 5 or C5. So we can start off talking about complex 1, which is NADH dehydrogenase. So this contains a prosthetic group called flavin mononucleotide, which is abbreviated to FMN, which is reduced by NADH to form FMNH2. The electrons are then transferred through iron sulfur clusters, or FES, within the iron sulfur proteins, which are sometimes known as non-heme iron proteins, where the half equation is as followed. So we've got the ferric ion, which then adds on to an electron to give yourself the Fe2 plus ion. And this can then go forwards and backwards, so this is a reversible reaction. As mentioned, the Fe2 ion can then reduce a following Fe3 ion, thus transferring the electron across the protein. The electrons are then finally passed on to another protein called ubiquinone, which I've spelled wrong there. But during the process, four hydrogen ions are pumped into the intermitochondrial space. So this here is just a brief overview of it. So as we see in the bottom, we've got NADH reducing the FMN. The electrons then go past down these iron sulfur clusters until it reaches ubiquinone here. And in doing so, four hydrogen ions are pumped into the intermitochondrial space. So now we're going to talk about ubiquinone. So this acts as an intermediate electron carrier. So, but when it's reduced, it's called ubiquinol, or QH2. Ubiquinol will travel through the inner mitochondrial membrane towards complex three. So it's going to completely skip the number complex 2, which we'll talk about later. So ubiquinol is then oxidized back into ubiquinone, passing the electrons on to complex 3. So you could think of it literally as a postman, so it takes the electrons or the letters from one place, and it's literally going off and delivering it to the next place. So cytochrome C oxidoreductase. This consists of three main structures. You've got cytochrome B, the risky iron sulfur proteins, a cytochrome C, which is a mobile protein, which means it can move along the intermembrane space. The electrons dissociate from ubiquinol onto cytochrome C. In doing so, four hydrogen ions are then pumped into the intermembrane space. Cytochrome C will then travel towards complex 4. So you can literally think of it as like a parcel delivery man. It's been delivered these parcels and it's now going on to the next step. Complex 4, cytochrome oxidase. Cytochrome C attached to cytochrome oxidase, which consists of three subunits, 1, 2, and 3, as it goes. 
The electrons are passed on to complex 4, which then pass the electrons on to an oxygen molecule with two hydrogen ions to form water. And again, in doing so, a final two hydrogen ions are pumped into the intermembrane space. So now the parcel is finally being delivered to oxygen, which is the final acceptor. So what are the total hydrogen ions that we've pumped throughout these complexes? So for only a single FADH molecule, so it's only one, we get four hydrogen ions pumped by complex one. We skip complex two, we go straight to complex three, where another four hydrogen ions are pumped. Then we'll move on to complex four, two hydrogen ions are pumped. So therefore a total of 10 hydrogen ions are pumped per NADH molecule. Okay, so now we're going to talk about ATP synthase, or complex 5. So the hydrogen ions are pumped back into the mitochondrial matrix by ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is a beast of a protein. Just look at it. It consists of all these different zones. Okay, we've got the alpha and beta zones on the F1, which is connected to an epsilon and a delta zone. Then up here we've got the C zone, which is then attached to an A, and two B zones right here. So ATP synthase will make ATP for every four hydrogen ions that are pumped back into the matrix. So in the F1 zone, there are many ADP and PI molecules. So every time a hydrogen ion passes through, the C zone rotates, and this will help facilitate the, the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. But therefore, if 10 hydrogen ions pass through ATP synthase, but remember only four, it needs four hydrogen ions to pass through to make one ATP, that therefore means 2.5 ATP molecules are synthesized for every single NADH molecule. So now we're just going to make a table of all the electron carriers and the, and the hydrogen ions and ATPs produced. So if we go back to the first presentation, which was about glycolysis, we know that two NADH molecules were produced. And in complex one, for every NADH molecule that goes through, four hydrogen ions are pumped. So if we've got two NADHs, that means a total of eight hydrogen ions are pumped. We then skip complex two, we then go to complex three, and remember, again, four for every NADH molecule, so we get a total of eight. And then in complex four, we only get two per NADH, which means we get four hydrogen ions. So the total hydrogen ions pumped from the carriers produced from glycolysis is 20 hydrogen ions. So if we do 20 divided by four, that means we get five ATP molecules produced by the electron carriers from glycolysis. And then we're going to move on to the link reaction. So remember, during the link reaction, for every pyruvate we get going into acetyl-CoA, we get one NAD molecule. But if you remember correctly, we get two pyruvates per molecule of glucose, which means we get two NADH molecules. And again, all the hydrogens coming up. And again, we get five ATPs derived from the link reaction. Okay, then from the tricarboxylic acid, Krebs, or citric acid cycle, we know we get six NADH molecules produced from it. So from complex one, that gives us 24 hydrogen ions. From complex three, it gives us another 24 hydrogen ions. From complex four, it gives us 12 hydrogen ions, which gives us a total of 60 hydrogen ions pumped from the, from the TCA cycle. And those 60 um, hydrogen ions will give us 15 ATP molecules. But then again, if you also remember correctly, we also get FADH from the tricarboxylic acid cycle. So, what happens to them? So, as you know from the TCA, succinate dehydrogenase synthesizes FADH2. And also, as I've just told you, succinate dehydrogenase is complex 2 in the electron transport chain. And this consists of four subunits A, B, C, and D. Pretty straightforward. The electrons travel through the electron centres in these subunits before finally binding to ubiquinone, which then gets reduced to ubiquinol. Ubiquinol then binds to complex 3, again pumping four hydrogen ions as the electrons bind to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C then goes to complex 4, where it will pass electrons to the oxygen, and pump another two hydrogen ions. So a total of six hydrogen ions are pumped into the intermembrane space. This is because we skip complex 1, which would which would add another 4. So therefore 6 divided by 4 means only 1.5 ATP are synthesized for every molecule of FADH2. So 
So if we get fire from the glycolysis, we get fire from the link reaction, we get 15 from the NADs from the tricarboxylic acid cycle, and we get 3 from the FADs from the TCA cycle. So that means we get 28 ATPs from the electron transport chain in total, right? Actually, it's not as straightforward as that, because as we know in biology, things aren't exactly complicated. <clears throat> and I bet you're probably pulling this face, you're probably like, ah, what the heck is this? What are you telling me? Well, let's just say there's a bit of a design fault when it comes to glycolysis. So this is the exception. So in glycolysis, the two energy H's are come from the cytoplasm instead of the matrix. So in order to get from the cytoplasm into the matrix, it needs to have a certain mechanism in order to enter the matrix and it does this by protein shuttles. One of these shuttles means that when the NADH will pass into the matrix, it will miss going through the first complex, which therefore means that the amount of hydrogen ions pumped will vary from zero, so none at all from those NADs, to eight, which is the possible maximum. And now you're probably confused, like, what is science, what is going on? But don't worry, it's not as complicated as what you think it is. So here I've got glycolysis highlighted again. So this is what we had before, we've got the two NADs, and in complex one is when we get the eight hydrogen ions pumped. But obviously if it skips, we'll get a vari variance of zero to eight. And all that does is just change the total amount of hydrogen ions pumped from 20 to around about 12 to 20. And as a knock-on effect, we get about three to five ATP produced instead of back on five. <coughs> so instead we get 26 ATP instead of 28. And the shuttle used is called the, the G3P shuttle, or G3P dehydrogenase. So NADH from glycolysis entered into the electron transport chain when it reduces dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. The G3P can then be oxidized by the mitochondrial G3P dehydrogenase, and this process will reduce FAD into FADH2. So instead of the NADH going straight into the electron transport chain, it's bypassing complex 1, and instead it's using complex 2 and synthesizing FAD. So the FADH2 will then follow along the electron transport chain, pumping only 6 hydrogen ions in total. So there we go, that's the same table. So now you can see how it's bypassing complex 1, and it's actually entering in from complex 2, and only synthesizing along this route here, instead of here. So what is the total ATP produced from glucose metabolism? So in glycolysis, we've invested two to phosphorylate the glucose, but overall we get four produced, which means we get a net yield of two ATP. In the link reaction, we get no ATP synthesized. In the Krebs cycle, we don't get any ATP, but instead we do get two lots of GTP. And then from the electron transport chain, we get a variance of 26 to 28 ATP which means our net yield is 28 to 30 ATP molecules and 2 GTP molecules. And that's it guys, I know this has been a pretty mind-boggling presentation, but I hope you guys understood it and withstood it as best you could. But here's the test yourself section, so here I'm going to ask you three questions. I've allocated a number of marks for you to get, I'm not going to tell you the answers. The marks are only there to give you guidance of how many things you need to include. So the first question for five marks, name the five complexes which make up the electron transport chain. For one mark, what is the net yield of ATP from the electron transport chain? And then an essay style question for 25 marks, outline the process of the electron transport chain and design a table showing the net yield of ATP synthesized as a result of the electron carriers. So as always guys, thanks for watching, good luck revising because I know this helped me revising and good luck in the exam guys.